At this point, we've learned a lot about forces. We've learned that forces on an object can be added to determine a net force. And we can use that net force to determine the changes in motion of the object. And this isn't a simple concept. In fact, for most of human history, people didn't understand this. One of the first people to really begin deep thinking about why things move was Aristotle. Aristotle was a Greek philosopher who lived in the 300s BC. Aristotle came from a line of deep thinkers in Greece who aimed to explain the universe. He was taught by Plato, who was taught by Socrates, all famous early philosophers. Aristotle lived and worked in what we call the ancient world, way back here in our historical timeline. Note that we're up here in the modern era. Now, although Aristotle was a brilliant philosopher, much of his physics was incorrect. Given this, it's worth exploring his ideas on forces, in that it helps us to better appreciate how he convinced people to think about forces his way, and how we now have a much better understanding of the universe. Aristotle taught that a force is required to keep an object moving. Okay, it seems to make sense on the surface. You give a push to start an object moving, but the key word here to consider is keep. A force is required to keep an object moving. Now, people accepted Aristotle's teaching in that it seemed to make sense for a lot of things. That is, if you're pushing on an object and you stop pushing, well, the object eventually and generally stops. In our day-to-day -day experience, we don't see anything moving off forever. But given that, it didn't work well to explain why some things stopped more quickly than others. And why things flew through the air and didn't stop when the force stopped pushing it. Aristotle had to come up with all kinds of creative explanations for where these extra forces were coming from that kept these objects moving. And it was a bit reaching, but then it was the best explanation that people had to describe how things moved. Isaac Newton was born in the 1600s, right here in the early part of what we call the modern era. So looking back at our timeline, we see that Newton, who was influenced by others of the modern era, including Copernicus and Galileo, only changed the way we look at forces after about 2,000 years of people believing Aristotle's work was the absolute truth, despite all its difficulties. All through the Middle Ages, through most of recorded history, progress was thwarted by quite an aired view of motions and forces. Isaac Newton suggested a brand new way of looking at motion and forces. He laid out three laws that are the foundation of much of modern design. Newton's laws have been the main tools which have accelerated technological progress in the modern era and got man to the moon. While Aristotle thought that forces kept things moving, Newton explained that forces start things moving, but that objects tend to keep moving on their own, unless acted on by outside forces. Things don't naturally stop, as Aristotle thought. They naturally keep moving at the same speed and in the same direction. This is Newton's first law. An object will remain at rest or in uniform motion, in a straight line, and less acted on by an outside force. Basically, it's saying that a force is required to change motion. If there's no force, then the object keeps moving along at the same speed in a straight line. This relates to our net force, in that if the net force is zero, all the forces are balanced, 
then the object's motion doesn't change, whether it continues to stay still or continues to move along at a high speed. It just keeps doing what it's doing. Newton explained that when a person is pushing an object and they suddenly stop pushing, the object comes to a stop, not because of any natural tendency, but because of another force, friction. Friction is acting in the opposite direction to your push all along, but once you stop pushing, it becomes the only force, and that's why the object starts to slow down. During the push, our free body diagram looks like this. And we calculate F net as 100 newtons minus 40 newtons for our friction force, and we get 60 newtons. Once we stop pushing, the free body diagram changes. The applied force is now gone, and all that's left is the friction force. The 40 newton friction force is the F net now, and that's what makes the object stop. If the friction force is smaller, let's say we're pushing an object on ice, then the same thing happens, except it speeds up more and it takes longer to slow down, which we can now explain. It slides for a while after you stop pushing because the frictional force takes longer to slow it to zero. Newton's laws explain why the first object stops quickly but it also explains why the removal of the applied force has a different effect if you're on a slipperier surface. An object being shot into the air also experiences friction, but it's in the form of wind resistance, which is a very small friction for something aerodynamic like an arrow. Again, let's use a free body diagram to consider what's happening. While the arrow is being shot, the bow is applying a large force on it, let's say 200 newtons. The friction force might be 1 newton. So, F net during the shot equals 200 newtons minus 1 newton equals 199 newtons. Therefore, the arrow speeds up very quickly and it takes to the air at a real high speed. Once the arrow is in the air though, the applied force from the bow is gone. And in the horizontal direction, we are left with only the frictional force. So now, F net just equals one Newton to the left. So, the arrow is slowing down. But it's slowing down so gradually that you'd never really notice it. The arrow therefore flies through the air long after the applied force from the bow is gone. Newton's model explains all these different situations much better than Aristotle's ever did. The less the friction, the more the object is left to continue on in the same motion, and the farther it goes. The concept of no friction was really a thought experiment in Newton's time. That is, a situation where an object is moving in a frictionless environment was just left to the imagination. With opportunities to enter space and create vacuums, we've been able to verify that this theory works great in these environments. Thus, Isaac Newton was definitely one of the most, if not the most, influential scientists of the modern era. In this tutorial, we mixed a lot of history with science to better understand forces and motion. We can see why Aristotle was able to convince people to follow an arid understanding for over 2,000 years, as it did make sense for many things. And it wasn't until the modern era that scientists finally started to question Aristotle's ideas and tried to better explain the errors being observed. By including friction in their considerations, scientists like Newton made assertions about how objects naturally continue at a constant motion, 
without forces being applied. Newton's laws, along with his other contributions, radically changed science and drastically improved our ability to understand the universe.